Well, it has been an amazing week, and I just probably messed up somebody's music. And we want to just uh, spend some time looking and learning uh, together about this theme that we've been on all week long of uh, STEM. And uh, the theme verse this week has been this verse. And if you'd prefer to follow along in a Bible, uh, there's uh, the page number. If you want to use a Bible in the pew in front of you, I will be putting uh, all of the verses up on the screen this morning as well. But this has really been uh, the theme verse based out of uh, a letter that was written to the church in a city called Corinth. It was a Greek city, and uh, their claim to fame, one of their claims of fame is they had the second most famous athletic event of their age, second only to the Olympics. And so when uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to them, he used a metaphor that they were very familiar with, and that is the athletic games. And he said, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Now, we could have easily have taken this verse and talked about and used some of STEM when it comes to biology and athletics, but we wanted to emphasize more the physics sides of STEM this particular year, and so we turned this into a racing verse, which would go something like this. Do you not know that in a car race, all the drivers drive, but what? Only one receives the prize. So drive that you may obtain it. And, uh, and before we even jump into this verse and the metaphor and what it can teach us about how we best can live our lives uh, as long as God gives us here, uh, let me just make sure and establish our beginning point because uh, I'm guessing that some of us have different beginning points when we begin to talk about the purpose of life. Our beginning point is that God is infinite and perfect and that he is the beginning point for everything. And so, for example, uh, the kids have been learning about uh, Newton's three laws. Uh, Ryan just talked more about potential energy and kinetic energy. They've been learning about all those things our beginning point is that God created everything and that he even created those laws, the natural laws, and the way things interact with each other. And uh, we, we say that, and that is our beginning point for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that uh, we believe God is infinite, he's holy, and he has the ability to create things out of nothing and he has uh, the wisdom to know how everything should work together in right and healthy ways for the benefit of all of creation and for him to get the credit for what he has done. And we believe that God has just graciously, uh, if you will, stooped down and told us about who he is and some of those things in what we call the Bible and that that truly is a revelation to us of him telling us things we would not otherwise know. Now, it doesn't tell us everything. It doesn't tell us how to build a car. And so there's a lot of things that we learn and we create and we do, but they all have a beginning point in working with God, what God created and in agreement with all of the laws and rules of how he created materials and things to work together. The second reason we would believe this is that, um, is just how, how do we uh, recognize how things are made in the world in which we live? So for example, if I look at this car, if we look at this car, uh, can any one of us here come up with a design for every detail of this car? And do any of us here have all the skills necessary to make this car as well as the fuel that runs it and all that? And I think the answer would be what? No, none of us have all that ability. Or a lot of you have in your pockets 
or in your purses or something, a, a much more complicated device called a what? Cell phone. Do any of us have all the ability to understand all the dynamics of what it takes to make that thing so helpful to us and so useful? No, none of us do. But, but what, else do we, what else do we believe about the cell phone? What else do we believe about the car? Do we believe that someone walked into an empty room after a year, 10 years, uh, let's say a million years, and all of a sudden, boom, a car was present. Or all of a sudden, just a cell phone came into existence that perfectly functioned. Do we believe that? No, we don't believe that. We believe that there was intelligence behind it that learned how to work with materials and maybe come up with some new combination materials and learn how to take the laws of nature and make you, maybe take them to a whole new level of understanding and application. But, but that, that, that all came about by people really smart and a whole bunch of them really smart. And we believe the same thing is true when it comes to the things that we cannot observe and know. We believe that if you look at creation and how it functions, there is somebody smarter than all of us behind it all. And if we look at all of matter, there is somebody who made all of that, and that is God himself. We believe that's the logical conclusion to come to when we look at the world in which we live. And so our beginning point, all that to say, our beginning point is that God is the creator, he's the one who makes the laws, and we just are on this discovery process to learn more about who he is and more about how things work together. And oh yeah, we can figure new complexities, but still God is the beginning and the source of all of that. And so when we come to this particular verse, uh, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, so run that, you may obtain it. We understand that uh, this is a metaphor to help us to understand things that are hard to understand. In other words, there's points that we easily understand in running a race or in a car race that have applications to our particular lives that are not so easy to understand. And I believe there's four points along this way. And in fact, let me just put it this way. Do you not know that in the race of life, all people race, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the believers in Corinth and just as applicable to us today, saying, listen, we only have one life to live. How are we to live that life? How are we to run that race so that it accomplishes what God intended for us to experience in the race of life? And so we are in this race of life, and we want to make actually four different points between this metaphor of a, of a car race and the race of life, of how we live our lives now in a way that we are winners, in the way that we can win it. So the first point of comparison between uh, uh, race car drivers and races is the race of life has a designer and sponsor. So think about car racing for a minute. Think of the Indy 500. The Indy 500 has a designer or designers. I mean, they decided it would be, what, 500 miles long. They decided it would be in Indy. They decided it would be during the daytime. They decided the shape of the track. They decided what kind of cars would go on it. They decided all kinds of things. I mean, there's a myriad of details that, that uh, some people designed that race to be. And so there's a designer, but there's also sponsors that help pay for it or make it happen. You can even see a couple of them uh, even here on, on this particular advertisement for them. 
but you can go on to the individual race cars, and behind each race car, there's designers. And on each of the race cars, they always advertise who's paying for this deal. Okay, you can't see them very well there, but they're a little bit bigger there. And so you can read Presto, and you can read some of the companies that have funded uh, Petty in this old race car of his on, on, so he could get in the race. So there's sponsors of the Indy 500. There's sponsors for each race car driver and their crews and their designers and all of that. And here's probably one of the newer cars. That's an older one. This is the first, uh, evidently, hydrogen electric race car. And, uh, and so, again, there's designers, there's uh, sponsors that make it possible for the driver and the pit crews and all of those to work those things. Now, when we think about the race of life, who is the designer and who is the sponsor? It is what? It is God. It is God, specifically God who is the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are the designers and they are the sponsors. And so we see this, uh, it's implicit here in the verse in 1 Corinthians 9. Here's a verse that makes it much clearer. For by grace, I, let's read this together actually. For by grace... Yeah, and we see here in verse 10, this is, this is describing the designer and the design, isn't it? For we are God's workmanship. In other words, that car is uh, the workmanship of that particular company and all of those people that work together for that. We are God's workmanship. In fact, what? We were created. He brought us into existence in Christ because of our relationship in Christ Jesus, and, and he's, he's the designer, and what did he design us for? What? Good works. Good works. And is God flying by the seat of his pants, trying to figure out what to do with our lives today because of whatever choices we've made? Nope, he prepared all this beforehand. He's prepared it all beforehand. He's the ultimate designer, and he's also... The sponsor, for by what? Grace you have been saved through faith. Grace is that word that describes his sponsorship. You talk about gasoline, having potential power, that then gets, gets used into kinetic energy. Grace is that word that sums up so much of the potential power, moving from potential power to real experience in our lives the ability to know things, the ability to choose what's right, the ability to do all kinds of things that God calls us to do. And it all comes to us as a gift. In other words, the designer designed it in such a way, as Zach said earlier, so that the price has been paid for us. It comes to us as a gift, not a result of works. So what? So we wouldn't boast about what we've done. We would boast about what? Our designer, our sponsor. We would boast about him and what he has done. And so there is a race, and this race of life has the designer and sponsor. It is God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So the next question is, how do you get into the race? How do you get into the race of life? Well, how does someone get into the Indy 500? They have to have a car. They must exist, first of all. And then they have to meet whatever the entrance requirements are. Our parking lot is filled with your cars, our cars. And guess what? None of them are going to get in the Indy 500. <laughs> Why? Is it because we don't want to drive that car in the Indy 500? I think a lot of us would love to do that, wouldn't we? It's because what? If we pulled up, they would say, you don't meet the entrance requirements. 
See you later. And so it is with life as people. First of all, we have to exist. Are you a person this morning? Yeah, we're people. So we meet the first one. What about the second one? What are the entrance requirements to get into the race of life where we live in the grace of God and live out his design for our lives? What are the entrance requirements for that? Well, there's something called the Romans Road that takes the book of Romans and uh, probably the most theologically complete book in the New Testament and just picks up some of the verses along the way to highlight how someone gets in to the race of life. And here's the way it begins. You can follow along if you want in your Bibles. But it begins with this statement in verse 16 of the first chapter, where the Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the good news. Gospel is that term that's used to describe how God's grace comes to someone and gets them into the race of life. And he says, I'm not ashamed of it because what? It's the power of God for salvation. It takes the potential of what God has done on their behalf and makes it a reality so they are actually saved. And this is true to everyone who believes. And in their day and age, there was two ethnic distinctions Jews and Greeks, Jews and everybody else. In other words, it doesn't make any difference what ethnicity you are. It is the same work of salvation that is potentially available to everyone. Now, the obvious question that pops out of this, if you're new to this, is so why do I need to be saved? Why do I need good news that God is the designer and sponsor. Why do I need that? Well, it goes on two verses later to say, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. Now, this is quite a statement. And what this statement says is that by nature, you and I, even though we know there's a God, we want to suppress the truth of who He is, and we want to live life our way. There's within us a rebellious heart that says, I don't want to live life God's way. I don't want anybody telling me how to live life. And so there's a suppression of the truth of who God is. Now that is made even more clear in the third chapter in this simple verse. For it doesn't make any difference who you are. There's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That rebellious heart, that suppression of the truth of God means that we sin against God. We think things that are not pleasing to Him. We say things that are violations of what he would have us ever say to people. We do things that we ought never to do. We don't do things we should do that he would want us to do. We don't say things that he would want us to say. And that's simply called sin. Sin is a picture of missing the bullseye. Missing the bullseye of behaving and thinking just as God wants us to think in all perfection. And it doesn't make any difference who we are. It means we fall short of the perfections of God, which means going back to that, that verse in chapter 1, means we deserve the judgment and wrath of God. We deserve that. And then the verse that Zach quoted for us earlier, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, eternal death. The wages, that's what we deserve because of our sinfulness. But the gift of God, this is the gospel, this is the good news, isn't it? The gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
And to go on to another verse, it describes this. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for, for us. As we sing, Jesus paid it all. He paid the price for our sins. When Jesus hung on that cross, he personally bore the punishment that we deserve for our sins. And he was crucified for that so that our debt for sin is paid in full. And going on in Romans then, how do you make the entrance requirements? That's all potential, but how do you make it so that you're actually in the race of life? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your boss, He is your Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. You'll be saved from what? Ultimately, you'll be saved from the wrath and judgment of God. That's the one you need to be most concerned about. That's the one we need to be most concerned about. For with the heart one believes and is justified, we used that word in our catechism, didn't we? For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. There's an integrity of a response to God from our hearts and through our lips of being unashamed of what Christ has done in our lives to save us. That's the entrance requirements. The entrance requirements is to recognize that there is a God, he's the designer, and he is the sponsor of life. I, by nature, live in rebellion to him. There's a price for my rebellion to him, whether I've sinned once or sinned a zillion times. And that is, I deserve the judgment, the wrath of God. But the miracle is, the love of God is, that God sent his only begotten son, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life. He hung on the cross. And as he was hanging on the cross, God the Father poured out all the wrath upon his son that I deserve, that you deserve. And when someone recognizes and owns their sinfulness, and recognizes they need a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior, and they believe that in their hearts and confess that with their mouths, they have met the entrance requirements to be in God's race of life. Today, around the world, in our own city, there are many people who exist, but they're not in the race of life. They do not know Christ as their Savior. And yet God wants them to. He wants them to meet this entrance requirements and to get in to the race of life. Well, once you're in the race of life, how do you stay in the race of life? And that's what the next verses go on to tell us. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the price? So run that you may obtain it. What does that mean? Every athlete exercises self-control in all things, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I just realized I should have put this in racing terms. That would have been a fun verse to put in racing terms. You know, I don't drive whichever direction I want on the racetrack. Uh, I don't just use whatever kind of engine or gas or whatever. I, I don't waste anything. A race car driver doesn't waste anything uh, if they want to run the race. Now, here's the key distinction between the race of life that God has for us to run as followers of His and an athletic contest or the Indy 500. In those contests, you're competing against everybody else. In the race of life, you're simply competing against yourself. And that's what these verses make clear. All of us are competing against ourselves in the race to live for God. And so we exercise self-control upon ourselves 
We drive, not aimlessly, we drive and live our lives very intentionally. Because the reality is, is that even though we meet the entrance requirements, uh, we still need to live in a relationship with God so that we stay in the race of life, so that we don't waste our lives and run aimlessly going whichever way that we may want to go. And, and so we stay in the race by continuing to live and to trust God and to listen to what He calls us to do and living the way that He wants us to live. And so that's the, one of the big differences between car racing, athletic racing, and the race of life is because God holds each of us personally responsible for how well we have said yes to Him how well we have grown in our relationship with Him, how well we have obeyed Him, how well we have run the race of life, how much we have opened up the gift of salvation and lived in the blessing of that. And so, this is what we've seen so far. The race of life has a designer and sponsor. It is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you have to get into the race by being a, a person and by meeting the entrance requirements of believing that you're a sinner, believing that Christ is the only Savior, putting your faith and trust in Him. And you stay in the race by continuing to live your lives in trust to Him. Now, let me just say to you, that's what we exist as a local church for that purpose right there. That's why we exist. We exist to grow in our understanding of who God is as our designer and our sponsor. We exist to help people get into the race of life. We exist to help each other who are in the race of life stay in the race of life. Now, if you're unfamiliar with our church, let me just tell you, we have four core ways that we seek to do that. We help people know God. We help people engage as family. We help people tell other people who are not in the race of life yet about the race of life and help them come to trust Christ. And we help them praise God and live their lives dependent upon Him through prayer. And so let me just briefly go through those. Knowing God and living our lives according to the Bible. Just as car racers, the drivers are always learning the designers are always learning. The pit crew is always learning. So you, you, you and I continue to need to learn about God. Because just as the race car drivers know there's more to know about technology and skills, we know there's more about God than we know now. And, and you get hungry to know more about who God is so that you can live more in the realities of who He is. There's just always got more. God's always the God of more. And we want to continue to grow in that. But we also need to engage as family in God's church because that's a major way that we help each other. We really are a pit crew. We're a pit crew helping each other out. Different skills, different abilities, different places in life, all kinds of differences. And we desperately need each other to help Live the race of life better and better and better and better. Thirdly, we organize our lives to tell other people about Jesus because many people who are not in the race of life and are doing different things this morning in Huntington Beach have no idea that there's a divine option for life. They have no idea of what awaits them when they take their final breath. They don't know, just as I didn't know for the first many years of my life. And thanks be to God, somebody came and told me. I mean, I was pretty thick-headed. It took me a while. But nonetheless, people told me. And we want to make sure that people keep being told there is a God, and He has an amazing design for your life, and He's going to provide all you need for you to live the fullness of life. 
You can get into the race and you can stay into the race. And the fourth of the core four that we have is living our lives praising God for being our designer and sponsor and saying, just like the driver in the race car in that headset, as Ryan mentioned, always in constant communication. Always in constant communication. You know, I'm feeling this. I'm seeing this. I just got hit by this car. What do I do? You know, is the pit crew ready? All of that communication is simply called prayer. And, and we live in constant dependence of God through prayer. So here's the best part of this race. The best part of this race is there's a finish. And the finish, every finisher wins eternally. That's found in that phrase there that I highlighted in yellow. They do it, the ones who are racing in the Indy 500, the athletes who run in the Olympics, they're doing it to receive a perishable wreath. But what? We, an imperishable one, a perfect, eternal reward at the end of the race. And when's the end of the race? When we take our final breath or when the Lord Jesus returns? In car racing, you're never sure if the car is going to hold out. There's a lot of cars that don't make it to the end of the race. Either because there is some flaw in the design, or the driver did something they ought not to have done, or some car banged into them and knocked them out of the race. You know what's the beautiful thing about the race of life? When you come in under the entrance requirements of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you continue believing, he who began the good work in you will bring it to completion. He'll get you across the finish line. He'll get you across the finish line. And here's the other best thing about the finish line. Every winner of an Indy 500 who's ever stood on the trophy stand and drinks that quart of milk, <laughs> that's what they do. What are they thinking? They're thinking about the next race. They're thinking about, what are we going to do to get better? Because you're only as good as your last race. You know what the beauty about the end of this race of life is? You never have to worry about self-discipline again. You never have to worry about what it means to get better again. You never have to worry about how to control your tongue or your thoughts or your actions. Because at this finish line, you are made perfectly glorious. Perfect. And you're in a perfect place where nobody's going to run into you. You're never going to get banged up. And you have this full relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Whew! That's the deal, isn't it? That is the amazing deal. And it comes to us all as a free gift from God. So here's what we've seen. Our lives have a designer and they have a sponsor. It is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God has done everything that is necessary for us to get off of the regular living of life and to get on to the life that he has for us, the race of life in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you agreed that you need him? Have you believed that in your heart? Is that coming out your mouth? that Jesus Christ is Lord. If you are, then you're in the race of life. Let's stay in the race of life by continuing to know God, engaging with other believers, telling other people about Him, and continuing to tune your hearts in response to Him in praise and prayer. And don't worry about the finish line. God will get you across it. He'll get you across it. The beautiful thing about God is he knows each of us this morning and he knows exactly what he would want us to respond to this truth from his word this morning. Your response to me is really not important. Your response to him is critical. And so let me just ask you to bow your heads, please. And without being concerned about anybody else but yourself, because it is your race to run and it is you who stand accountable and rewarded by him. Just let me give you a, a few seconds 
to just respond to him from whatever the Spirit has taught you and shown you this morning would be a right next step for you. Thank you, Lord, for a chance to spend a few minutes with you this morning together. Thank you, Spirit of God, while we're all sitting in the same room, thank you that you're very personal in the way that you meet each one of us. And thank you that you know better what we need than we know ourselves. And so thank you for whatever you have said to each and every one of us this morning. Lord, create in our hearts a default that says, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord because you're the designer and the sponsor of the life that you want us to live. And we want that life. So thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Seal it upon our hearts. Help us to walk in whatever we have said to you this morning in real life application. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen.